All right, our last talk for the day is Dr. Ethan Miller, KHGU, uh, sounding the ionosphere with signals of opportunity in the HF band. All right, so thank you, Nathaniel. And I understand if any of you need to leave, this was a last minute addition. But after seeing some of the talks earlier today, uh, I realized I had an already approved for public release uh, presentation that might actually speak to this crowd. So, um, so I asked Nathaniel if I could slot it in. So uh, I won't be offended if you leave. Um, so anyhow, this is uh, a talk that I gave um, at the Ursi National Radio Science Meeting uh, in January. This is when we ran our, our Lyles errand, as uh, uh, Casey and I uh, began to refer to it, uh, up to Fort Collins to, to make the WWV measurements. So, um, uh, a quick couple of things. Uh, there are several hams uh, in, uh, in the author list. Uh, Steve Clemson is a physics professor, or Steve Kepler is a physics professor at Clemson. Uh, he's AD0AE. Uh, Juha Virinen uh, is an uh, electrical engineering professor in Norway. Um, I believe his call sign is OH9FCC. Uh, Nathaniel, of course, is in there, and Phil is in here. Uh, Paul Bernhardt is KF4FOR. He works at the Naval Research Lab. Um, do we have any other hams in that list? I don't think so. So, um, anyhow, let's get started. So, oops, wrong keyboard. Um, so the, the key thing uh, that we're interested in uh, is uh, how is the geospace system coupled? And this is something uh, that Hyo Min, I think, did a really good job introducing uh, in his magnetometer talk earlier. But um, one of the key questions is how do we observe the relevant quantities uh, in the ionosphere and thermosphere that are inaccessible to in situ observations, right? Um, we have to contend with orbital mechanics, the vastness of space and the finitude of funding. Um, and so the, the key thing uh, with that then is, uh, do the observations that we're able to make accurately describe the system uh, to some useful level of fidelity, right? Uh, we want to be able to specify the state uh, of the system at a given location, and then ideally drive some physics-based model to predict the future state of the system. And uh, a key thing, um, particularly because we have an NSF program officer in the audience, how do we do more with less uh, to return uh, on that uh, research investment? Uh, so anyhow, this is, this is some thoughts on how, how one might do that. Um, and HF is particularly well suited to this, uh, this problem, looking at the ionosphere and lower, lower thermosphere where it's hard to access uh, in situ because we get significant refraction. Um, and it also is an interesting way to probe the ionosphere over water or otherwise inaccessible locations. So, um, so that's one of the things we're going to be uh, interested in. So um, quick overview uh, on HF. Um, and I mentioned some of this already. The key thing is, um, we'll look over here. Here's a ray trace. Uh, this is um, an actual uh, uh, ionospheric ray tracing model. Uh, you'll notice it has uh, incredible similarity to the ENVIS talk that we saw earlier. Um, very high uh, elevation angles. Uh, this is from three transmitters on the south coast of Puerto Rico to a receiver uh, on the island of Culebra, um, which uh, my friend uh, Angel in the back is, is very well familiar with, uh, with, our, with our equipment there. Um, and so it, this, this data set will feature uh, prominently in this, in this discussion. So, so uh, we're given access to a couple of observables uh, with HF signals. Um, we have a binary observable, and that's the existence of a link. Um, and so the truth table only has one T in it for that, um, usually, and that is that the link occurred. Uh, we don't know, um, you know, we don't necessarily know the state if uh, the transmitter was off and the receiver received nothing. That's sort of a null result. So, um, so anyhow, uh, that's, that's a simple observable and we'll talk more about what might be able to be done with that later. Um, you saw a little bit about uh, uh, phase path and Doppler shift earlier, specifically Doppler shift, uh, but these two things are interrelated. Uh, and we can look at lots of, of time and frequency standard uh, signals uh, throughout the HF spectrum uh, and below. And I'm not going to talk about those specifically here because they've been well covered uh, earlier. Uh, I'm going to focus on delays um, and, and from dedicated sounding systems and signals of opportunity uh, that exist uh, sort of in the wild, uh, particularly the ocean wave radars. Um, so uh, there's uh, presently open source software uh, that exists, uh, written by Juha Virinen, uh, right there, uh, which uh, pick up ionosons of a more primitive variety uh, that have a, a frequency modulated continuous wave signal that just increases monotonically in frequency. 
Uh, this is a sort of a classical uh, Ionasan technique, and, uh, and, and there's at least uh, two of them uh, in the continental United States, and uh, there's, there's several in the Caribbean and South America, and there's several in Europe and a number in Australia. So uh, these are systems that are, are, are relatively easy to receive, and uh, the software by Yuha is incredibly clever, um, and uh, it allows us to do that. Uh, the ocean wave radars, which I mentioned, uh, the trade name is CODAR. Uh, that's, a, that's a company name, uh, but there's other uh, variants of these. Uh, they're, they're surface wave radars. They scatter off the ocean waves. They brag scatter, uh, so they, they're sensitive to waves that are of dimension half the radio wavelength. Um, and then uh, you saw the stuff that, that Phil Erickson did with time and frequency standard stations. Um, so we can look at polarization. Uh, we can separate the magnetoionic X and O modes. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about that here. I'll show some more uh, examples about that. Um, we might also be able to do things with the angle of arrival. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, uh, HFDF discussion uh, earlier. Uh, and this is easier uh, on loud signals with good spec cross spectral properties. Um, so, uh, and the final thing we might look at is, is signal level or signal to noise ratio. And I think uh, we saw a little bit about that too. Uh, but it depends on a stable uh, transmitter and, and, and receiver characteristics. So this is an example. I don't know if this is, is this a movie? This, oh, it's not a movie on this one. Okay, so um, this, is, this is an example of uh, an ionogram that was collected uncooperatively uh, from one of these FMCW chirp sounders. Uh, the key thing here is that the range is twice what you would read on a normal ionosonde because I'm not co-located with, you know, with the transmitter. So I, I do the total path up and back. Uh, and this is very consistent with the 560 kilometer path uh, that was mentioned in the end of this presentation. So uh, a couple key features uh, on this. Uh, this is the surface wave. So this was done in Puerto Rico. And so there's a, we were only about 40 kilometers away from the transmitter. And so you can see the highly conductive um, Caribbean Sea is conducting uh, that signal uh, directly along the surface of the Earth. Um, this here's the, the E region, and um, then there's the F1 region and F2 region. So the interesting things uh, about this is you get close to the critical, oh, by the way, this is the ordinary mode and the extraordinary mode. So they, they split, uh, and you can see they're sort of shifted because the refractive index is different for the two different modes. Uh, and that's due to the Earth's magnetic field. So, um, and it's the, same, it's the same effect we heard about in the last talk, uh, but applied uh, a little bit differently. So. Um, what was I saying? So when you get close to this critical frequency, right, so you sweep across in frequency and you pick up the ionosphere and all of a sudden you punch through uh, the ionosphere and nothing comes back down. So, but as you get close to that critical frequency, uh, you'll see that the, the delay increases uh, rapidly. Uh, and so, uh, so that, that cusp uh, there is something that'll possibly play into something we're going to talk about uh, in a minute. So again, uh, CODAR uh, in Puerto Rico. So CODAR transmitters look sort of something like this. You may have seen them uh, when you've been on the shore, um, and they're just sort of a spire. Um, they're about 40 watts output power, uh, pretty continuous. They do chop it. Um, and this is our receiver uh, in Culebra. This is the old site. There's a new site now. Uh, these are cross-dipole antennas uh, spaced 16 meters apart. Uh, on a north-south baseline. It's not exactly north-south, and in fact, one of my colleagues, a co-author on this, was trying to do angle of arrival between the two, and he actually figured out that the number I gave him was not right on the azimuth based on, uh, on his measurements. So anyhow, I thought that was neat. These are DX engineering antennas. I'm sad that Tim Duffy's not sitting in the back to hear that those are DX engineering uh, active dipole antennas. Uh, they, uh, each one has a phase-matched uh, cable uh, on it, and there's uh, several pounds of ferrite at the top to try to keep the common mode off uh, and try to preserve some polarization isolation. All right, so this is what CODAR observations look like. Um, so uh, a couple things uh, on this. Um, so the intensity of this is the received power. Um, and then the color bar is actually uh, a measure of the polarization. So if you see, um, and I don't remember which is which in these. Um, red and blue are basically right and left hand circular polarization, and green is a linear polarization. Uh, and sometimes they get mixed in, so um, they, they cancel out and, and show up green. So uh, a couple things. Sunrise is here. The ionosphere builds in very fast at sunrise, as we heard earlier in the morning. 
Um, then it sort of bounces around through the day. These are probably those tra traveling ionospheric disturbances uh, that Nathaniel talked about. Uh, this is the E region, um, and this is the solar generated E region, right? The E region that's there every day um, due to uh, solar illumination. Um, these little spikes here are probably meteors. Um, they're just little speckles. Uh, this is a sporadic E layer right there. Um, this, you can sort of predict when this is going to occur based on the solar zenith angle where the sun is in the sky. Um, so uh, sunset is somewhere over here uh, on this plot, and you can see that the ionosphere persists and this link stays open uh, for, uh, for a while. This solid line here is the surface wave. Again, it's much, much clearer on that one uh, than it is on the bottom. So interesting thing is here, this is where the critical frequency um, drops to the point that there's no link anymore. Uh, you'll notice, though, that there's a white dashed line right there. And so it happens that we have um, another auxiliary source of observations at that time. Um, and so here we collected the CODAR from space uh, at the same time, and you can see the two different transmitters, but we only have one magnetoionic mode that came through this time. So we're very close to where, where, we, where we punched through um, here. So it, it, what happened was the geometry was such that we got here, we got this, this situation where the um, Basically, the extraordinary rays came back down to the surface, and the ordinary rays punched through and were collected at the satellite. So, uh, sort of an interesting uh, uh, situation uh, that I thought was worth sharing that shows the importance of polarization uh, observations. So, on the preceding day, uh, we did the same thing, and you'll notice that the, we lost support for the link, uh, you know, maybe a half hour, an hour before this, the satellite went over. And in this case, uh, we got mo both modes uh, came through. And again, I colored it with a polarization. So uh, you can see uh, that those two modes have distinct uh, right and left-hand circular polarization. All right, so now we summarize this from three different CODARs for the year. Um, sunrise is this dashed line, sunset is this dashed line, um, and this is 18 months of data. Um, so this is the September 2017 uh, when the hurricanes uh, hit, the, hit the island. Um, the antenna actually survived, is my understanding, uh, the hurricane. Uh, I remember seeing the, uh, the, the P3 overflights where they were imaging, and I could see a little turnstile right there uh, where, where my antenna was. So um, anyhow, the thing that this didn't uh, survive uh, was moving to a new site. So they, they, when they recompeted the observatory, they moved to a new location, um, and so um, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't move to the new site. So uh, a couple interesting features in this, in this plot. Um, again, the color, or th in this case, the color is, is the delay. Um, so uh, short delays are red and long delays are blue and sort of medium delays are green uh, for these three different circuits that are all fairly close to each other. Um, so uh, we can see sort of an absorptive bite out during the middle of the day uh, on all of these, especially during um, you know, periods of long uh, sunlight. Uh, the other feature that's sort of interesting, and I, I brought this up uh, this morning uh, to a couple people at a coffee break, is this is an enhancement in the middle of the night. Um, and you can see it in, in several places. Um, and that's, that's due to something called the midnight collapse. Uh, so the winds uh, change and they drive the ionosphere down uh, in altitude. And, uh, and so anyhow, you get, uh, um, you, you get that enhancement. The other thing about that is, as you push the ionosphere down, it tends to recombine faster, and so um, it disappears uh, pretty quickly after that. So you'll notice that there's sort of a, a sharp uh, cutoff. All right, so um, long-term absorption observations. So um, we can kind of get an idea what the D-region absorption looks like uh, with a setup like this um, using, uh, using these, these systems. And uh, so here, I've just sorted the received power uh, based on uh, the solar zenith angle. Um, and so you can see there's, there's sort of a, a pretty clear relationship that the higher the sun is in the sky, uh, the more absorption you get, or the weaker the signal is. So, um, and that was, you know, like a five minute analysis where I just swept through all the data and made a plot. So um, we haven't looked into that in, in great detail yet. Oh, I'm yellow. Okay, so um, one uh, final thing. Uh, is looking at uh, reverse beacon network uh, data. And this was sort of one of the early uh, crystallizing uh, 
uh, Hamsai activities uh, with Nathaniel um, was uh, uh, sort of, I call it the ionosphere's pocket litter, right? And you guys are probably reading this, I can start to hear some chuckles. Uh, it's basically, any, anybody who's familiar with law enforcement uh, knows that the pocket litter of, of the accused is something they always want to go through and figure out, uh, you know, sort of where has this person been, does their story check out? Um, so uh, I refer to uh, RBN data as the ionosphere's pocket litter, right? That's where, where the ionosphere has been, uh, was sort of imprinted uh, on, on the RBN. So um, I'm going to just flip through uh, sort of movie-like, to use Scotty's uh, terms, uh, a couple of interesting uh, observations. So. Um, this is another whacked, whacked out color mower. Um, so red is the population of 80 meter links, green is the population of 20 meter links, and blue is the population of 10 meter links. This is for an entire year versus local time at the midpoint. Um, and so we see, obviously, at nighttime, 80 meters rules during the winter. Uh, during the summer, at night, 20 meters often opens. Um, and during the day, in 2014, uh, 10 meters and 20 meters were, were frequently open during the day. So what else do you see that's interesting uh, about this? Um, they're vertical striations, right? So I took a cut through that and, and did a 4A transform and pulled out the periodicity. There's a seven day period. So that's the weekends, right? So um, you know, contest, contest, contest uh, every weekend. There, there's, the, there's the evidence that contests happen. So. Um, so uh, maximum usable frequency. Um, so uh, I'll go through this briefly, but basically we figured out a way that you could determine the maximum usable frequency using uh, RBN uh, spots, and uh, we did it thusly. We ran uh, links uh, across uh, a grid, and wherever we thought there should be a reflection point, we dropped a pin down, and then we sort of had a sieve that collected the highest frequency link that crossed that bin uh, in, uh, in that cell. So it makes a map that looks sort of like this. And so this is the sunrise and sunset terminator of the dashed lines. Um, it's a little bit faint, but this is North America. Uh, and you can see uh, as the sun comes up and, and goes across North America, the maximum usable frequency increases. Um, you can see just like with the CODAR, uh, the atmosphere stays strong after sunset for a while uh, before disappearing. This was during a CQ Worldwide uh, contest. And this is only using RBN data, nothing else. Um, so, so now we compare it to some ionosons, right? This is a sort of truthy ionospheric measurement. And uh, it, it's not as bad as you would think it is. So um, the, the red is my RBN estimate uh, of the maximum usable frequency, and the blue is what the ionosons said. So you can see we catch, you know, the first and maybe, or the zeroth and maybe first order uh, variability. Here's where we change it to the actual ionospheric density using some simple geometry. Uh, and in this case, we line up relatively well. There's no, no filtering applied to this other than um, just shoving it through that algorithm that I, that I described. So uh, this is Boulder, Colorado. And this is Millstone Hill. And this is Point Arguello, which is um, at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Okay, so uh, another adventure uh, was we put one of these CODAR receivers on an icebreaker and drove it around in the Arctic uh, Ocean. Uh, you can see the track up there in the upper right. And uh, this is a lot of structuring from the aurora. Again, you see the surface wave is this sort of solid bar across the bottom. And those are uh, auroral structures. There's a three CODARs on the north slope. Uh, this one uh, is named SIMP. I don't remember the name. Fort Simpson maybe is the location. Um, but here's our box, and uh, in this case, uh, we hooked up one of those $2,000 uh, Edis Research radios to a $30 Raspberry Pi uh, to do the data logging. Uh, the Raspberry Pi actually was the ideal thing for this because that box got coated in ice uh, when we were up uh, in the Arctic Ocean, and so we didn't have any spinning disks, so that, uh, that, that helped us out quite a bit that we didn't freeze uh, up there. So. All right, one, one last adventure since my light is red. Um, we collected during field day uh, with EPOP uh, spacecraft. And so this is what field day on 40 meters looked like uh, from space. The color here is the polarization again. And the one I'll call out is on 7019, you see there's one with the polarization changing over time, right? Uh, it goes from red to sort of blue green. So um, anyhow, that's what I did on my summer vacation. So. <laughs>
Ethan, um, there's a uh, satellite allocation on 40 meters, and as far as I know, it's never been used. Yes. And um, was talking with um, one of the AMSAT guys about um, doing a 40 meter experiment. He said, well, it would be such a long antenna that it would cause the thing to sort of deorbit. And I said, well, maybe that would be a good deorbiting mechanism, but I don't think we've ever transmitted 40 meters from outside the ionosphere back down to Earth. So that might be a real interesting, uh, you know, we're always looking at it going the other way. So this right. might be an opportunity to look at it coming back and seeing if it acts the same. Yeah, that's interesting. So the only thing like that is they, they have had ionosons on satellites that, that probe down, but they haven't done that for years. So uh, we're ripe for, for a new experiment. So yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Let's get one more round of applause for Ethan Miller. <laughs> <laughs>